uh, please be advised that we do have a limited time in this facility, so we all need to be out by 9 p.m. Uh, as far as the candidates go, please be advised that you have a two-minute opening statement, one minute to answer each question, and about a minute in closing. So if anyone has any questions now, we can address it before 7.20 hits. Okay, I think we're good. And also thank you to Richard Kawano, who actually was the chair of uh, tonight's candidate forum. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started so we can have two minutes on the clock. Um, if we could have the candidates for District 25, that would be Representative Sylvia Luke and Mr. Ronald Lamb. <laughs> Mr. Lamb, you can go ahead and um, make your two-minute introduction. Good evening, everybody. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, my name is Ronald Lamb. I was born and raised here in Honolulu, way back in the 40s. Uh, I've been around for a long time. I was uh, raised in uh, Kaimaki, and as a young boy, I moved to Makiki. I attended the uh, Bingham Track School. Some of you may remember the elementary school back then, and then uh, the Hawaiian Baptist Academy for four years, and then I graduated from Kamehameha High School. My roots go back to uh, Papakolea. That's where my grandmother was born and raised. And uh, from there, I uh, then went on to the university, graduated with a degree from the Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And I was uh, commissioned uh, an officer in the military. Uh, during the Vietnam War, my orders took me to Germany. I served there for three years. And uh, after that, then I lived on the mainland for a few years and moved back here to Hawaii. My background, professionally, uh, I was a uh, real estate developer on the mainland and uh, later started a career in, in finance with, uh, as a financial planner with uh, life insurance. I was hired by a company here in Hawaii. That's what brought me back in the late 80s. And uh, I was a manager for two life insurance companies. 30 seconds. And had kind of retired from that and uh, went into kind of retirement, but uh, some people thought, well, maybe I should uh, come here and see if I can run for office instead of complaining so much. So okay. that's why I'm here. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Mr. Lamb, for that introduction. Next, we have our state representative, Sylvia Luke. Thank you. Aloha, I'm Sylvia Luke, and I wanted to thank the Makiki Neighborhood Board for putting this on. Uh, every two years, I uh, <coughs> think Makiki Neighborhood Board is one of those that have been diligently um, allowing uh, candidates to speak and at the same time inviting neighbors to hear some of the concerns. So, you know, um, this takes a lot of coordination and effort. And thanks, Richard, and the rest of the Makiki Neighbor Board for uh, putting on a forum. Uh, for our state house races, uh, rarely we get to um, uh, speak about issues and come to a forum, so this is very special. Uh, as you know, um, I've been in the House of Representatives for the last 16 years. Um, I grew up in Pa'oa, uh, went to Lincoln Elementary School, Kwanaka Middle School, Roosevelt High School, on to uh, University of Hawaii. And when I first decided to run, it was such a pleasure to represent those people I went to school with, aunties and uncles who are my neighbors. So it's, it's a very special neighborhood. If you look at Pa'oa, Nubuanu, Papakolea, they're uh, diverse at the same time, it's it's very a tight knit community, and it's just been a pleasure and an honor. Uh, the honor is, um, you know, only 76 people actually get elected into the legislature, and we deal with um, six billion dollars of budget. In the last few years, I was a finance chair, and uh, during that time, uh, you know, my policy, and thanks to other legislators here, uh, like Senator Brickwood, um, Galateria, and Representative Della uh, Bellotti, I think we did a lot of good things, making sure that we cut costs in state government, investing in the future, putting away money in rainy day, and we're going to continue those policies. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Questions from tonight's audience. Can I do come to the mic, please? 
I'm going to ask the same question of every candidate for a state office. Uh, where do you stand on putting a state library in the Makiki area, the conversion of the Makiki Community Library into a state library? Thank you for that um, question. You know, last year actually Dello was one of the champions to ensure that uh, the Makiki Library got additional funds. Um, I think libraries are very important, especially during the last six years when we had uh, a lot of cuts in state government. Library hours were curtailed. This year we uh, were happy to report that we were able to restore some of the library hours, and this is something that uh, if the community is supportive, it's something that Della. Um, Brickwood and I'd be willing to work on. You know, I'm, I'm so new to this, I apologize if I don't have any real answer for this, but uh, I'm, I'm here basically really to listen to the community as I, as I walk, and uh, I'll probably address that as I get more informed and more involved. Well, just for your information, the state does not support the library. The money that was allocated was for study to replace the library with the state library. Thank you, sir, for that question. Next question from the audience. Sir, come up to the mic, please. Thank you. I have a question, mm -hmm. same question for either one. And whatever your answer is, please explain why. The question will go to Mr. Lamb first. Uh, on Senate Bill 1, having been considered during the special session and being passed, was that the most appropriate time to consider it, or should it have been considered during the regular session? Please explain your reason. The question is the same for you. Mr. Lamb? Okay. Not, not having been involved in that you know, myself personally, but as an observer and as a citizen, uh, I was uh, watched that very curiously to see how that was handled, and uh, I, I think you know I, I feel that uh, that an issue uh, it's law. I'm a law-abiding citizen, so whatever the laws we abide it, whether we agree or not. I mean, I I don't care to pay taxes, but I'm a tax-paying citizen, whether I like the law or not. Uh, but as far as the issue itself, um, I, I am walking the neighborhood as I talk to people. My job is to listen to what people say, and I will vote the way that my constituents uh, indicate that. And that's why I'm running for office, is because I think there's an indication that there are two sides of the picture. And uh, I, for one, uh, for the record, I am for traditional marriage, and I'm also for the rights of other people to enjoy uh, their rights also, so we can live together with our differences here in the state and enjoy the state. That's what it is. Um, you know, we, we live in a place with the Aloha spirit. Mr. Yes, Ron, thank you. Okay. Representative Luke, same question. Thanks, Arvid, for the question. As um, he mentioned, it's, he was dealing with Senate Bill 1 that was uh, uh, relating to uh, marriage equality, which the legislature took up during special session. I think it was um, more appropriate to deal with it during special session. And the reason for that is, um, you know, we had thousands of testifiers and, um, you know, we allowed uh, probably five to six full days of testimony which would not have been possible during regular session. Um, I, uh, running um, the Finance Committee, you know, we, we pretty much deal with probably hundreds of bills. We, we deal with uh, several thousand um, testifiers and if I were to uh, have dealt with any issue, any issue that comes up during regular session, you know, I mean, it would have significantly curtailed the ability of citizens to voice their opinion because as, um, as lo some, of, some people may know, you know, I run a pretty tight shift in finance and, you know, I can get through about 40 bills and three hours and you know that would have been very unfair if we dealt with the same-sex marriage issue and the implication and the importance of that issue in regular session because it would have taken away from all the other issues and it would have uh, it would have really stifled public discussion. Thank you Representative Wu. Next question from our community. Um, I've been, I've been um, increasingly concerned with these large development that 
developments that have been coming into Hawaii that start at 1.5 million per per unit, or one point like in Pa'oa, 1.2 million per unit. There's like 24 units in Pa'oa. Um, so I guess what I want to hear is your ideas, uh, your opinions on what effects this might have in any of our communities and um, in relation to also affordable housing, your ideas. Good question. Uh, again, you know, this is my first time in office, uh, but I have been you know, looking at some of the plans for proposals of uh, uh, projects, housing that would have some impact right around Punch Bowl. And, uh, you know, we have a beautiful state, and yet we know that there's uh, dense housing, and there's a need for affordable housing, and the prices of real estate continue to climb. Uh, that, that, that's a very tough issue, of course, that we can't answer right now. I am involved in one issue that's outside of this, and has to do with my nonprofit organization in Chinatown. So I've been involved in that affordable housing for, for seniors. Uh, so that's something I'll be watching very closely. Thank you, Mr. Lam. The, um, the issue of uh, large amount of development that's happening right in the urban core is a major concern. And I think the public, especially those people who live in Kaka'ako area, is very concerned about the huge amount of development that is happening in Kaka'ako. And that's why, um, you know, as I said again, um, the, my House and Senate colleagues, in, especially uh, Senator um, Valeteria and Representative Bellotti, along with myself and Representative Scott Saiki, work really hard to make sure that we put some restrictions on um, the ability of HCDA to allow uh, unfeathered development in the urban core. Uh, outside the uh, jurisdiction of HCDA, what's going to happen in HCDA really affects the housing prices all over. Because as you can see, the ward, uh, one of the ward structures um, that's coming up, it's not right, even yeah. 1.5, it's $4.5 million. And what that's going to do is drive up costs, not just in that area, it's going to drive up costs for everybody else. One of the significant things that the legislature did this past year is put in an additional $11 million into the rental housing trust fund. And what that $11 million means is not just, a, not just a direct funding of $11 million, but it's working with the city and private developers to leverage that funds to build affordable rentals, affordable units. And we have already um, identified uh, developers who are interested in building affordable units. So I think that's going to make a significant impact. Representative Luke, thank you. We have... Um, we're allowing one more question for our House candidates for District 25. Sir, come up to the mic, please. Thanks, uh, Levine Mikiki, but uh, what do you feel is the top uh, issue of concern in District 25, and what is the specific legislative proposal you have to address that? And if you have time, what do you think is the biggest state issue that needs addressed, and what's your plan to solve that problem? Good question. I really wish I had a quick answer for that. I, I really don't. But for myself, uh, I know it costs a lot to live here in Hawaii, so I'm looking at several issues that have to do with our cost of living. And uh, the taxes that we pay, they keep going up, right? Property taxes, income tax, uh, we have all kinds of taxes. And those are the things that we sometimes don't see. It's invisible. Uh, I don't have any quick answers for that. but. I'm a citizen like you are. I live here. I feel the impact. So maybe I may, may not be speaking for anybody else here, but for myself, if I'm typical, uh, those are things I'm looking at. Uh, also, I think that education is a big issue also with our school system. The biggest challenge for the districts in urban core is infrastructure. Uh, because uh, the development happened here and it's moving out uh, to the other <coughs> side. You see the schools in our area, you look at Roosevelt High School, you look at um, schools in Makiki, Makiki uh, in the Punchbowl area, you look at them compared to what's happening in Bililani, Kapole, uh, I mean they have state-of-the-art schools and we don't. You look at the roads, you look at some of the city roads, um, you know, it, it's in poor condition compared to what's going on elsewhere. And that's something that, you know, we've been working with um, uh, Councilwoman uh, Carol Fukumaga with, because it's it's not just 
the state, you know, we need to work together with the city on that. I think one of the biggest issue, I'm going to talk about a couple issues if I can. One of the biggest challenges that we need to look at is what's going to happen to rail. Um, you know, I don't know if some of you know, but I've never been a proponent of rail. Uh, mm -hmm. But now that it's happening, you know, I want to make sure it's done right. And so one of the things I keep emphasizing is you are going to need skeptics like me who didn't support rail in the beginning, who's going to make sure that all the um, T's are dashed and all the um, dots are there. Okay, sorry. I'll put that in much. the closing. Absolutely. <laughs> um, before we go over the closing statements for our candidates for House District 25, we would like to invite the individuals who are in the hallway to come on in, since just so you could have a better view or you could hear better. So you're more than welcome to come in. I just feel that, in fairness to the candidates, that you should not always have one candidate go first in answering questions. Oh. They should alternate so that others have a chance to, to rebut the earlier comment. Because other way, it wasn't fair to Mr. Sorry, Wow? Lamb, Lamb sorry. So, anyway, just in fairness to every candidate, so I hope you do that to the other candidates. Oh, our apologies for that, ma'am. What yeah, we were I doing was that. a... That's a good suggestion. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for that suggestion. We'll be more mindful of it. Thank you. Okay, so we have a one-minute closing statement for each of the candidates from House District 25. Uh, go ahead. Actually, let's have Miss <laughs> Representative Sylvia Luke come up since she, like you mentioned, she has been um, coming in second. So please come on up and make your closing statement. Again, thank you to Makiki Neighborhood Board. One of the things I think um, is going to be a challenge for the legislature in the next few years, we just got the, um, the state finances report and our revenues are down. Uh, and so we're going to continue to take an aggressive approach to make sure that, you know, the way I look at it, I look at myself as stewards of taxpayer money. And, you know, I'm not going to um, spend um, thing, uh, things and I'm going to question everything. And, you know, the legislature worked really hard for the last two years to even cut the uh, governor's budget by about $400 billion. So we're going to continue to work hard and make sure that, you know, your monies are valuable to us and we're going to treat it that way. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Representative Luke. Mr. Lamb? I can speak in general terms. Uh, I'm one for uh, a little smaller government, less government intervention, because I believe that the strength of our economy here in Hawaii really has uh, rests on those who uh, who are probably the smaller small business, uh, not necessarily the big business. We do have a situation here where I work with companies where uh, it's it's a tough call as to whether or not to invite more opportunity and competition from outside businesses because that takes away businesses here. So it's a very fine balance. I'm very sensitive to that. I've worked with that before. But I am looking to create a place that economically is more affordable and uh, there are ways to do it. No simple answers, but basically I'm here for the people as another option if people are looking for some change. Uh, that's why I'm running. I'm not a career politician. I'm, I'm more like uh, you guys, but I'm your voice. And so if, I, if elected, uh, I will represent my constituents. Thank you, Mr. Lamb, and thank you to both of our candidates very much. We are now moving on to our house race for District 24. So if we could have Mr. C. Cowie J. Amsterdam up, as well as Representative Della Albalati. Again, we're starting out with a two-minute opening statement. So, Mr. Amsterdam, go ahead. I want to give our... Oh, go right ahead. <laughs> Representative. Good evening, and I want to start also by thanking the Makiki Neighborhood Board. It's a real pleasure to work with this board and the community because I think uh, this community works hard to make sure all voices are heard, uh, considerations are made for all, and that we work toward the best policy um, for all the residents in the community. Again, my name is Della Albalotti, and it has been my great privilege and honor to serve District 24, previously known as District 25, but now 24, uh, for the last eight years. It has also been my great privilege and honor to be the health chair, and I really want to thank uh, my colleagues, such as Chair uh, Sylvia Luke, for entrusting me with that very important position. We are going through tremendous changes in healthcare, from 
mandates that are being um, passed down upon us um, from the federal level, from just adjusting to the high cost of health care and figuring out how we're going to ensure that there is access to good quality health care throughout our communities. So as I um, work and continue to work during this interim, uh, as I continue to work through the election, those are the things that I'm focused on. And I thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Representative. And now Mr. C. Kaui J. Amsterdam. Aloha. Aloha. I want to thank the uh, board for the opportunity of my candidates to be able to come together and to speak so that you can understand what's going on. Um, I'm a person who believes in term limits because it provides more people an opportunity to participate and it, it integrates creative ideas. Um, therefore, I, I feel that it's time for a change, that we need more participation uh, from our, um, our community, members of our community. We're very creative. Um, and it, it also eliminates the stagnation that goes on, um, that naturally goes on when people are in office um, and, and there are no changes. And this could be one of the symptoms of some of the problems that we are experiencing today. So um, I would like to encourage greater uh, participation by members of our community and meet some of the um, needs that we, we not only face here, but nationally and internationally, and to bring our, our community uh, into a framework of this nature so that we will make greater contributions not only to our, our particular district, but also to um, the state, nationally and internationally also. I've, um, I've studied at eight universities, uh, locally, nationally, and internationally, and I've, oh, I've served over 35 years with humanitarian projects throughout the world. So I, I would ask you to remember, Amsterdam's the man. Amsterdam's the man. Mahalo. Thank you, Mr. Amsterdam. Questions from our community? I already know Representative Pilate's position on the question I'm going to ask, so I'm just going to understand where do you stand on the conversion of the Makiki Community Library from a privately run library to a state run library? Uh, mahalo for the question. Um, I received my master's at, um, uh, at UCLA. Education is very important. And one of my uh, favorite places at UCLA was the library. I spent many nights sleeping there, uh, or many hours uh, studying there. <laughs> and so I think that we should have the status of being a state library with all the benefits. Um, Makiki deserves it. Our district deserves it. And education is based on the knowledge that we acquire, and so the library deserves that. Thank you. And when will we see you enter the library to get a library card? What was that again? When will you be coming to the library to get a library card to support the library? Oh, well, you're talking about it on a state level? Well, no, I'm talking about the Makiki Community Library. Immediately, as soon as we get this done. Thank you, Mr. Amsterdam, Representative. Uh, I'll be very brief, um, just because we have an a audience out there looking. I do support the conversion of the community-run library to a state library, but I understand that it's going to be a lot of work, and so we need to work with our state leaders, we need to work with our city leaders, and we need to work with the community to ensure that we uh, get the kind of infrastructure we need for our Kiki and our Kapuna who frequent the library now. Thank you. Thank you. Next question from our audience. Sir, come up to the mic. Thank you. This question will go first to the representative, and now I ask Mr. Amsterdam to answer the same question. Uh, this past session, the senator in charge of the Judiciary Committee, uh, who represents, represented the Kaneohe, where the state hospital is, held a series of um, intensive hearings, heard mainly from the staff. And as a consequence, recently they went through a different, different a changeover in the directorship. The focus of the hearing was basically the health and welfare of the staff. I don't think I heard one word 
in the press about the patients. I mention this because in Matiki, there's a heavy population of people who have been released from the state hospital. I remember hearing from time to time that there have been uh, death, suicide by police. You are the chair of the health committee. If there was a concern with the current leadership of the state hospital, the new leadership for the welfare of the patients, not strictly and only for the staff or union members, would you do follow suit what Senator he did? Thank you. The question will be the same for you. First, I want to uh, thank the senators for doing an important service by conducting those hearings, but I also think that we are not just talking about what's happening with the patients. We are, as a legislature, acting to ensure that the mental health services in our community are strengthened and restored from the cuts that were sustained during the recession. I have been actually very uh, diligent in following up with what the Adult Mental Health Division is doing. They, again, are restoring funds but it's going to take time. The concern for patients is, uh, is, is there. We have to uh, ensure that we have the mental health service programs out there, particularly for our homeless population. We know that there's a lot of um, uh, kind of over, overlay between uh, mental health issues and homelessness. So certainly the mental health of our community is something that I will focus on. Um, and one last thing I would add is that over the last session, we did pass a law that is going to create uh, assisted community treatment and help those families who have uh, uh, members who are suffer suffering um, severe mental illnesses to get the help that they need, if, and if they need to, through the court system. We understand that um, mental health is a complex issue, that there are families and individuals who are seeking help, so we need to make sure that the programs are there to help them. Thank you, Representative. Mr. Amsterdam? Uh, mahalo, and again, thank you to the board for this um, gathering tonight. Um, I've served, uh, as you can see, I, I'm in the health field also, and I serve with um, our elderly, our kupuna, as well as um, our young people and our, um, our middle-aged people. I've served in a HEPA hospital in um, Thessaloniki, Greece, Lichten Einstein Hospital in Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, Santa Monica Hospital, uh, St. John's in Santa Monica, also at the um, University of California Medical Center in San Francisco, and also I'm um, I also serve at the um, Lunalilo Home here with our Kupuna. Um, the central part of our uh, delivery is is to our clients, and so therefore it's essential that we communicate with find the needs, the interests, the issues, the treatment, the problems of the of the patient. No matter where we go, whether it's locally, nationally, or internationally, the, the patient, without our patients or our clients, we're out of business. So we, um, for instance, at Guna um, Home, the patient is the center. But we also include relatives. We include the staff. We can include the community. So we, we have to be Thank more you, comprehensive. Your time is up. Thank you. We're moving on to your closing statements. So, Mr. Amsterdam, go right ahead in one minute. <laughs> I want to thank my candidate for the courtesies. Um, again, it's been a real privilege and honor. Um, I focused on expanding um, access to health care. I focused on funding um, for uh, programs for children, women, and kupuna. And one of the areas that I'd like to continue to work on, which I think is very fruitful, um, is the collaboration between education and health. I think as we move forward, as we look at the federal funds that are going both into our health care system um, for this, for, for this year, um, in our budget, uh, Health and Human Services uh, was over $2 billion, that's 20% of our uh, operating funds. Uh, education is a close second. So we need to look at ways that um, we can co-locate services, we need to look at ways that we can consolidate services, better serve the children in both the health and education um, arenas where they're being treated, and then I hope, uh, you know, create a, a place where they can thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, thank you, Representative. Um, again, I think term limits, limits are very important. Um, to not have them, we have the example of what happened with the um, Hawaii Equality, uh, Marriage Equality uh, Act of 2013, in which the, uh, the, the voters, the constituents, were not 
their needs and will were not um, uh, addressed and provided. Um, uh, with Ron Lamb, he said he will listen. So we need to listen and then we have to do what our constituents say. Everybody does that at the beginning. So we have to maintain that. Greater sense of unity and a, a greater sense of community in, in, our, in our district. Also to, to meet a more comprehensive needs of the youth, the singles, the kapuna, families, um, and those who are disabled to solve the homeless problem. One of my representatives is a homeless person. We can't find him because he's homeless, but we hope that he will appear so he'll be a part of our solution. So to be able to do these things, to meet these great needs, and to provide leadership for other districts here in Hawaii Ne, so that we can only not only meet our needs, but need to meet the needs and stand out uh, with Hawaii Ne, and then be a, um, international also. Having served with uh, in Israel, we can also provide great blessings for Israel too. May the Lord help us so that we might be a shining light in the islands of the sea, and acknowledge that we have these great blessings that come from on high. Thank you so much for this great opportunity, um, and aloha. Thank you to both candidates for State House District 24, Representative Dan Alvarado and Mr. Steve Howie J. We are now moving on to our City Council race for District 6. So I'll be calling up the candidates in alphabetical order. We have Mr. Sam Iona, Council Member Carol Fukunaga, Mr. Steve Miller, and Ms. Jolie Tokusato. Introductions in the same manner as well, in alphabetical order, Mr. Sam Iona. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to come here and discuss with you issues that are important to you. My name is Sam Iona. I want to thank the Makiki Neighborhood Board and all of those who are responsible for this, uh, the viewers out there in Olelo for uh, videotaping this. You know, I served in the Makiki area in the State House a while back, and uh, some of the issues that we faced back then are still prevalent today. And I'm running for the City Council because I'm concerned about what's going on in our communities. I'm concerned about Kaka'ako, what's going on in Kaka'ako. I'm concerned about the roads in our district. I'm concerned about the homeless. A lot of issues that I'm concerned about, and I hope you guys will ask uh, a lot of those questions in, uh, in uh, the portion uh, when the audience gets to ask questions. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I serve on many boards and commissions right now. I'm president of the Friends of the Missing Child Center. I'm uh, vice president of the Hope Services, which is a homeless program of the Catholic Church. I also uh, am the chairman of a steering committee to revitalize the Cohill Homes area. We got a grant from uh, HUD to revitalize the Cohill Homes area, and so I'm chairman of that. And so I'm very involved in the community. I care very deeply about uh, what's going on. I, I ran because I was concerned mainly about what's going on in Kataako, mainly because of the affordability of homes, or lack of the affordability of homes. And I'll tell you, when I've been going walking door to door, there's another concern that's being addressed, and that's roads, Second issue is the roads, and the third issue is the roads. And so um, I really want to get onto the council to help us fix those roads as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iona. Council Member Carol Fukunaga. Good evening, and I want to join with my uh, earlier colleagues in thanking the Makiki Neighborhood Board for hosting this session tonight. You know, as you know, Makiki is sort of a hotbed of democracy, and I certainly um, appreciate many of the uh, innovations that the Makiki Board has fostered over the years. For those who may not know me as well, I've been a long-term resident of Makiki, Tantalus area. Uh, I served in the state legislature, and currently I'm serving the last two years of the former council, uh, council member, Kelsey Gabbard's term for uh, the period 2010 to 2014. In my early, um, 
I guess, 18 months in the city council, I've actually had the opportunity to see why city government is so tough. You know, you are confronted daily with people's individual concerns and needs, whether they're sewer, uh, odors floating up through your bathrooms, like uh, some of the folks in Kaka'ako have experienced, whether it's overflowing uh, rain, you know, that is causing roads to flood your uh, communities and your neighbors' homes. Everything really comes before the city council. However, one of the things that is most distressing is the fact that even though you have 80% of the state's population here in Honolulu and the city budget is only $2 billion a year, we have really many of the biggest problems before us, whether it's homelessness, whether it's roads, as uh, uh, the prior speaker mentioned, or whether it's rebuilding aging infrastructure Very like serious. our sewer system. So part of what I have been able to do is really focus on how best to leverage my state experience with my former state colleagues and look for ways that we can bring together state, county, and other kinds of government and nonprofit support to solve our problems. And I'll speak about some of those a little bit more later. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fukunaga. Next, we have Mr. Steve Miller. Good evening. Thank you. I'm pretty impressed that everybody can do this without holding their speech. But mm -hmm. I'd like to start off by thanking the Makiki Neighborhood Board. And it's written down right here, so I'm not cribbing. Um, and also thank you, the audience, uh, for coming out and attending this. And, learning about uh, what the candidates have to say. My name is Steve Miller. I'm running for Honolulu City Council District 6. As I've been out and about campaigning and talking to people, I've met a number of people who don't vote. They no longer feel they have a voice. It doesn't matter. It's always going to be politics as usual. Obviously, I disagree with this position. But the last election cycle, three out of the four outgoing city council members went to the state ledge. All four of the incoming city council members came from the state ledge. When all is happening is a game of musical chairs, every two or th four years, you know, it's always going to be politics as usual. And we need change. The system is broken. It's time to set enough already. We have families living in the streets because our elected officials have ignored the problem for so long. And now, like a height, they're stuck in a ravine. They're grabbing at anything, whether it's criminalizing homelessness or adding to the city's debt so they can say to their constituents, see, we're doing something. Well, the next big crisis is going to come down the pipe is the city debt. By the year 2020, the city debt service alone will be $1 billion. And then, like now, they're going to grab at every fee and tax increase they can find to solve the problem when they need to make the hard decisions now. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into my solutions, but if you go to my website, voteforstevemiller.com, I don't simply say how hard I'm going to work. I tell you exactly how I feel on the positions and where I stand. I'm not a member of any union, the Democratic or Republican Party, so when the party bosses call, or the well-heeled backers call, I don't, I'm not beholden to anybody that way. Now, I can always vote for the best interests of citizens of taxpayers of Honolulu, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Now we have Ms. Jolie Tokusato. I wanted to say thank you to the Makiki Board for um, hosting this forum and for the invitation. Um, my name is Jolie Tokusato, and I too have been um, campaigning a lot, as you can tell from my face and down to my legs, my color is a lot different these days. But I just wanted to say, you know, um, people are asking me, why are you running for city council? And, um, you know, you're a hotel worker, you're a guest service agent, why are you running for city council? And, and I tell them, you know, I've been involved politically for a long time now. Probably for the last 10 years, I know that um, our legislators know that I've already gone to just about everybody's um, office by now, and and with one cause or another, I've testified on neighborhood boards, like the um, Makiki board and also Kalihi board. I've been doing a lot of political work already on a voluntary basis, mostly. But um, in the last year or so, I was involved in a, a bill that was introduced, um, Bill 16, and it was where I had um, I had gone to a lot of these places and said, listen, um, there there's a crisis going on in Waikiki, in the number one industry in the in the um, in Hawaii, and thousands of people have been losing their jobs, and millions and millions of dollars have been lost to the tax base because um, private equity companies have been coming into Waikiki, buying all of the <laughs> hotels, and then converting them into condominiums. And we need to um, we need to address this because this could, you know, affect our entire community, being 
Makiki, you know, community, um, IEA, all of the places that um, are, are City Council District 6 is involved in. So that's why I'm running. Um, I've testified there were 6,000 people who had said that this is important. 27 of our legislators and almost 100 small businesses all said this is really important. But yet when we brought this legislation to the city council, it was, um, it was deferred. And it was really, really disappointing because all these people have said, why don't we do something? And it was... Thank you, Ms. Takasanto. Thank you. That's why I'm running. It's because I want to be the voice of everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now questions from our audience. I'm going to hand this off. I think the uh, council position is very important, maybe even more important than the higher ones because it's so engaged with the, uh, with the community. Right now before the council are five bills uh, proposing to criminalize the homeless, um, subjecting them to uh, up to a thousand dollar fine and 30 days in jail, basically for not being able to afford housing in a, on an island where the median uh, single-family house is now $700,000. What is your position, not only on the criminalization of house, uh, homelessness, but on the affordability issue? Let's start with Councilmember Fukunaga. Thank you. Well, actually, uh, you already know my position. I have supported all of those measures. But let me tell you why. You know, for a lot of the businesses that I represent in the downtown Chinatown area, homeless individuals means that their uh, sidewalks and streets are always the bathrooms and the bedrooms of all of these individuals. Every morning, the lay shop proprietors have to come in, clean up whatever mess may have been left behind. They are among the ones who ask us to introduce legislation that would allow, I mean, that would follow upon the mayor's uh, introduction of bills 42 and 43, which would really try and move people out of Waikiki. At the same time, I totally agree that we need more services and we need additional housing for people who are homeless, and we have worked very closely with our legislative colleagues. This year, in the city council budget, we have added an additional $3 million to expand upon housing for homeless individuals who have chronic mental illness or substance abuse problems. We're also Thank you, Councilmember. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Um, I completely disagree. I believe that those bills won't even pass the constitutionality test. So, I mean, Alex, the neighborhood board guy, he got sworn in to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the state of Hawaii. And here is the city council, they're going to pass bills that are not going to pass constitutionality. So you're going to waste a bunch of money fighting it out in court. And right there, you have opportunity costs. And opportunity cost means when you spend a dollar here, that's a dollar you don't have to spend somewhere else. So I think you'd be better off uh, spending that money and, and dealing with the services right off the bat. Because when you're going to criminalize homelessness, it's going to cost you a lot more to deal with it through the criminal justice system than it is to actually deal with the problem. And like I said in my opening comments, the reason why it's a crisis now is because they ignored it for so long. Okay, um, what was the rest of it? <laughs> is that it? Is that good? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Ms. Tokusaka? For the homeless people, I, I think, um, you know, they're, I don't believe in criminalizing the homeless. I think they're already destitute and um, they are disenfranchised, so I think it's wrong. Um, it's going to just create more burdens on our judicial system. Um, I believe in Housing First Initiative and also maybe the Flight Home Initiative where we um, give them the opportunity to go back home where there's support services. I also think that we should, um, we, could, we should go and have the city and the state come together and then perhaps maybe go to um, uh, apply for federal funding. I think um, we should also, we should also um, keep the things that are already in place for them, um, active, and I think we should also um, make sure that, you know, I, I, I don't think that we should just put them in handcuffs and take them to jail. I think we should just help them more and keep all this um, um, health services and everything else come into play as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Tokosato. Mr. Iona, your response to the same question? Well, homelessness is such a big issue, I don't think we can answer it in one minute, but I'm going to try. 
First of all, I'm surprised that the council member says she cares about the homeless because if you go to the May hearing on Olelo at the city council, you'll find that she introduced a measure that would essentially kick out 300 people from the public housing, the city's public housing projects. I won't get into detail, but I can explain to you later because we only have a minute. Um, what I really want to talk about is this homeless situation. You know, the mayor introduced the Housing First program. The city council appropriated $47 million for the homeless to take 400 people, which is really about 10% of the homeless population, and put them into permanent housing because they believe you put them in the housing first and then you work with them. That comes out, folks, to $112,000 per unit. So we're going to take 400 of our chronically homeless, put them into a, a unit, a $112,000 unit, and then what? I'm very concerned about the then what uh, process. I have served as executive director of the Office of Community Services, worked with many of the homeless uh, nonprofit organizations. I think we should have the nonprofit organizations work with them and put them on a performance-based measures to help the homeless. Thank you. Thank you very See, I, told much. I couldn't do it in one minute. Follow up, please, someone. Next question from our community. Hi, my name is Laura Moy, and I'm really glad, Joel, that you addressed the issue of the condo conversions. We are seeing hotel workers lose their jobs. That has an impact on all of us, Mukiki, Kalihi Valley, on everybody. And we tried. We had 6,000 petitions. We sent so many people to testify. And city council and Carol, you did nothing. You literally, you didn't even vote it down. And so I want to know, as council candidates, what you would do to try and save hotel jobs in Mikey Peak. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for that question. You know, the bill that came before the Public Safety and Economic Development Committee was a bill that said, if a hotel owner proposes to change from a full-service hotel to a condo hotel, the city would establish a new regulatory process that would require that hotel owner to apply for a permit as well as give notice for the job losses or the job changes that might occur as a result of that change. What the Corporation Council advised the city council members was that those types of regulatory structures were beyond the scope of the city's authority. So then we proposed to work with the Hotel Workers Union to try and address the job loss issue. And we proposed specific task forces. We proposed to work with our state legislative colleagues and Department of Labor and Industrial Relations to really tackle the job loss issue up front. Unfortunately, that was not acceptable. We also asked the Hotel Workers Union to give us examples of what other jurisdictions have done. They Thank provided you, us with, if I could just finish, they provided us with moratorium legislation that the city of San Francisco had adopted in order to preserve their hotel room inventory, partly because it was an important competitive uh, um, uh, component in the city's ability to remain competitive in the visitor industry. And it also meant quality jobs could be retained. Again, in the city of Honolulu's instance, the Corporation Council advised the city council members that that type of power was beyond our scope. So again, we went back to the union. We did offer to work with the union on a number of different alternatives with our state and county and private sector colleagues. But unfortunately, you know, those, those alternatives were not acceptable. So I would say we did reach out. We did try to explore as many different alternatives as we could. Um, I'm sorry that you know, those alternatives were not acceptable. But thank you for giving me a little bit more time to explain. Thank you, Council Member. And we'll give the candidates a, a little bit more time as well, just so it's even all across the board. Ms. Takasato? When we, when we proposed Bill 16, that was a permitting system. It, it's not an outright ban on condominium conversion. It was something that was very um, dear to my heart because I was a hotel worker. I'm going to be okay. I have a job um, and my hotel job is still okay. But what about the thousands and thousands of other people who have lost their jobs and are soon to lose their jobs? That's the kind of thing that we were trying to address. You know, maybe, maybe, you look, um, people looked into it, maybe to start to look into other proposals, but then at the end of the day, um, this situation still exists. 
And, you know, that's the kind of thing that we have to start looking at. For myself, I want to do, um, I want to do for people who are like me, people who are um, hardworking citizens, we need somebody in office who is going to not look out, look out for the interests of um, big money. We have to look out for the people who actually have to live with the, with the decisions and policies that our lawmakers make. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Takasato. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be kind of tough to answer this question without coming off as sounding anti-labor, but I'll try. Um, the entire dynamic of the hotel industry is changing. Uh, the timeshare is the new uh, process that, uh, that's occurring um, in Waikiki. You can try and legislate, I suppose, uh, to stop progress, but um, I think in the end you're, you're fighting an uphill battle any more than the, um, you know, trying to uh, legislate against some of the businesses that have been, you know, wiped out or, or hurt by the internet or, or some other uh, thing like that. I, I wouldn't have supported uh, Bill 16. I don't like to see people lose jobs. Uh, Oahu's got a 4.4% uh, unemployment, which is, I think, by all definitions, full employment. Um, but uh, it's just the new reality of the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Iona? You know, Bill 16 was really about having hotel rooms turned into timeshares. And I don't care what you say about it, you know, I know Councilmember Fukunaga will say that it was because it wasn't in the scope of practice and the council said this and that. Let me tell you folks, I served in a leg legislature. Nine, 51 people, it's hard to get them to agree, but nine people can do anything they want to do. Look at what same-sex marriage was all about. I don't care what you agree, I mean, what you stand on the issue, whether you agree with them or not. But the legislature wanted to pass it. They put on a special session, they passed it. They can do anything they darn well please. And if the city council and the council member for council really wanted to pass Bill 16, they would have found a way. They would have told court council to do it. Every time there's a measure that comes up on a city council, they can do it. It's the will of the individuals. And obviously, when Bill 16 came up, it's a big issue in this race, obviously. Um, you know, she decided not to do it. The council decided not to do it. And I don't blame her because she had all these special interests that paid for her campaign the last time and you know they put out seven pieces of mail for her the last time she had to go with them she had she was in her pocket she couldn't help herself in doing that but if you had the will and the heart to stand up to the whole for the hotel workers and stand up for working class people you can do it and you know politicians and elected officials can do anything they want and so the spin is something that i wouldn't agree on and if i were on a council i would have well, passed bill 16. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Mr. Iona. We will go ahead and proceed to their closing statements. Since, I, as I had mentioned, we are short on time in our room here. So, um, since Ms. Tokusato was the last one to introduce herself, we'll go the opposite direction. Ms. Jill Tokusato. Oh, Jolie Tokusato. So, again, um, I am an average, ordinary person. I was born and raised on the Big Island by a father who, um, who supported a family of seven on one income and was able to afford a home and, and enjoy life and, and spend time with us. You know, and, and that's the kind of Hawaii I want to have. That's the kind of Hawaii I aspire to. But just in one generation alone, here I find myself struggling on a day-to-day -day basis just to get by. So, you know, in looking at the city council, people in there, you know, they might have lost touch with who are the, you know, are the constituents. I want to be, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are going to be, you know, listening to the people who have the money and everything. I want to be the voice in the city council, the one who's different, who's going to go and look at um, the legislation and go, hey, how is this going to affect the working class person? People like me, the, you know, I think that's important. We need a more balanced government. And, you know, like I said, there are probably going to be more educated people, um, smarter people. But, you know, we need the voice of somebody who Thank actually you, has Jill. to live and work with. Okay. Mr. Steve Miller. Okay. I think uh, maybe by now you have some idea of the similarities and differences between me and my opponent. So I'll just leave you with this. One day, a uh, warrior came up to a wise old Indian chief and he had his hands cut. And he took, asked the chief, he said, well, in my hands, I have a bird. Is the bird alive or dead? 
And the chief knew that if he said the bird is dead, the warrior was going to open his hands and the bird would fly away. And if he knew if he said the bird is alive, the warrior was going to crush the bird. So the chief looked at the warrior and said, the bird is in your hands. You guys have a choice. You have a decision to make. The choice is yours. The bird is in your hands. One last thing. If I am elected, I'm going to get that water fountain fixed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Miller. Council Member Carol Fukunaga. I have long been a proponent for using technology to help government more open, become a lot more open and transparent. And I would say um, with some of the uh, attendees tonight, we have worked very hard to make sure that they have full access to council meetings as well as the videos and uh, other information that would otherwise be available. As um, you know, all of you know, today is the age of the internet. So I would simply say you do have a choice. I would stand on my record. I am very uh, honored to have served the Makiki community for a long time, and I would appreciate and really uh, treasure the opportunity to continue forward. I do want to say that uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to respond to them. You can uh, either contact me at my office or send me an email online. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Carol Fukunaga. Mr. Sam Iona? I first want to finish up the where I was going with the homeless situation. So we're going to put the homeless in these uh, what we call permanent housing. They can't go anywhere because they can't get into public housing because public housing is full. I know that. I served on the board of public housing. Public housing is too full. Where are they going to go for public housing? Well, how about they move into Kakaako where we're building 5,000 units there? They can't because they can't afford $28 million. They can't afford $2 million. They can't even afford $500,000. But that's what we're doing in Kaka'ako, and we have a golden opportunity to have affordable homes in Kaka'ako so that public housing people, the people in public housing can get into the affordable units and maybe the uh, homeless in the Housing First program can get into public housing. But that's not gonna happen because the will of the elected officials is not there, folks. You know, you're going to hear a lot, you've already heard a lot, in your, uh, you've seen a lot in your mailboxes already, the bantering going back and forth. Listen, I am a positive alternative for you folks. I've served in the legislature, I served in the legislative branch, I served in the executive branch, I know what to do, I, and I know how to get things done, and I will get it thank done you if you give me that opportunity. So thank you again, Olelo, Makiki Neighborhood Board, and all of you for being here and being interested. Hello. Thank you very much for all the candidates for City Council District 6. If we could have the candidates for Senate District 12 come up and talk to our community, we have Senator Rickwood Galateria, Mr. Carlton Middleton, and Mr. Chris Leffen. Lead them. My apologies, sir. Okay. Let's do alphabetical order again. Senator? Yes. Yeah. Two minute opening statement. Okay, Aloha. 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 Uh, thank you to the neighborhood board for inviting us here to talk star with you and perhaps uh, answer some of your questions and certainly provide you with a little bit of insight on what we have done and what we hope to do uh, after the uh, next decision is made. I'm Senator Brickwood Galuteria, representing Senate District 12, which extends from Waikiki through Makali, Mo'ilili, Makiki, uh, Kaka'ako, and Halabuan. I'm uh, the majority leader in the state Senate. There is the concept of teamwork. The majority leader is, uh, provides that type of leadership because no man or no woman is an island. In order to provide good leadership and good legislation, everyone has to work together. I'm very, very pleased and proud to be able to say that uh, we advanced uh, legislation, very significant legislation, under my term as majority leader. One of the big movements was to increase the minimum wage this past year. We talked about labor, we talked about working, improving the quality of life, sustaining and ensuring quality of life. Uh, many other things uh, that were done, SB1 as an example, uh, equality of marriage, uh, HCDA in Kaka'ako, we, we uh, provided for new requirements uh, for the advancement of uh, development in Kaka'ako, pulled the reins a little tighter for HCDA. I want to continue doing that in the legislature, 
and uh, I ask for your support. I ask for your, uh, uh, not only for your support, for me, but for your manao as well. I am a family man, I have a family of five, I have eight grandkids, and I want to ensure their quality of life uh, for the coming years. So with that, I ask you for your support, and look forward to answering your questions. Mahalo. Thank you, Senator. Now, Mr. Chris Wicko. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Senator. I was going to use my notes, but I'm going to try and wing it. I'm not much of a public speaker, but I'm going to try and do my best here. Um, I got involved in politics 11 years ago. Um, I'm somebody who uh, spent two years getting his children out of a foreign country, bringing them back to the United States. I encountered a very anti-father family court system. And I came down to the legislature and I made a little speech and I got a standing ovation. The next day I got a call from Senator Chen Oakland and Carol Fukunaga asking me to join the legislative task force. So you have them, I have them to thank for me getting involved in Hawaii politics. So I've spent the last 11 years working to reform the family court to make it a place where it respected the role of both parents in their children's lives. And since then I've gotten involved, I worked as an office manager for one of the representatives and I also volunteered for Cindy Evans, who's another representative in the House of Representatives, working on various types of legislation. So I've had a chance to work on the inside of the legislature. And the thing is, as a father, I have a vision for the life that I want for my children in Hawaii. And I want my children to be able to come back to Hawaii. We, so many of us raise our children for export today. How many of you have got children that you raised and they have to choose between a good paying job on the mainland or not such a good paying job here in Hawaii? If they wanted to come home, they've got to make that sacrifice. And that's not right. That's not the Hawaii that I dream of for my children. I want it to be a place that they can come back home to and have a great paying job, paying job and have a great life. That's my dream for Hawaii. You know, we have a lot of elderly people today, and they need a lot of help. You know, one of the issues for us is letting these people age in place. You know, they need services. They need, they need a variety of services. And, you know, today they're stuck with an option of, Gee, I can take out a reverse mortgage and I can stay in place. But that means everything that they work for, they have nothing to pass on to their children. Mr. Lieben, thank yes. you. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Carlton Middleton, your opening statement. Yes, aloha, everyone. Aloha. Um, I, I strongly believe that this election is going to turn on one important. One important factor in our community, and that is the homeless. I'm not blaming them, I'm not blaming anybody. If I did, I'd be here all night. But the system is badly broken. The system is badly, badly broken. And I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. If I get elected, I will fix it. I'm not going to blame the homeless, but if it all turns on the homeless, they will destroy this island. I can guarantee it. Waikiki is suffering right now, and every time I go to a neighborhood board meeting, they're, they're, it's the same thing for six, eight years. It's been the same thing. And it's going to get worse. They can't fix it, but I will. Thank you, Mr. Middleton. Now, questions from our community. Come up to the mic, please. Uh, I haven't heard anything tonight about the prison system and why. Um, I read about it quite, quite frequently. I hear about it on TV, and it seems to be festering. It looks like it needs massive investigation. Um, uh, there's almost too many problems to even mention, but um, I, it, it seems like it's become a collection place for homeless, mentally ill, um, uh, just people who don't really belong in prison. And it's, some people suggest it's become an industry, and it's untouchable. I'd like to know what you think about that. Mr. Lieben? Oh. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of private um, prison 
systems today that are corporations that operate prisons. One of the interesting things is these prison systems are now going before legislators testifying to extend the duration of prison terms. Did you know that? Because it makes them more money. The longer somebody's incarcerated, the more money they make. So that's definitely a problem that needs to be addressed. There's also, of course, the issue of putting homeless people. We know we used to have a place for putting people that were schizophrenic. Um, we had nice facilities that we could put in mental institutions where we could take care of them, and they were advocates, and there was a process. Today, we're putting these same people into prisons because we've got nowhere else to put them. Again, we've got a, a, a low-cost, or a, a what we call um, um, affordable housing problem, um, where it's all gummed up because you've got nobody coming out of it, even though people are doing very well financially, and they have nice cars, and they've been able to put money in the bank, these people are not moving out of the system, so there's no room for anybody else. Thank you. Thank you for your response. Senator Valtteri? Thank you for that question. I agree that uh, the public safety uh, situation is very challenging. I sit on the public safety committee in the state senate, and we've taken a look at different models uh, to improve the system. One of the things we would really like to look at is, uh, I wouldn't want to say decriminalizing decriminalizing uh, the system, but there are many people incarcerated right now who really shouldn't be there. Uh, they have a low impact of criminal uh, uh, records, and perhaps we should get them into uh, much more constructive type of programs instead of just letting them sit there. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do with the public safety system. We're opening up Kulani Prison again up on the Big Island, and that is, and we're trying to bring back more more of our uh, uh, prisoners that we've sent away. It comes down to money per capita, per person. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to reinstill a sense of pride in the system because there are a lot of, uh, shall we say, uh, abuses going on. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Mr. Middleton. Good question. I like the question. You do know that it's costing about $500 per day per person for inmates to be in prison. A good bit of them are homeless, they've got serious mental problems, they've got serious problems, but they're not legal problems. It's costing us $500 a day. Why does it cost less to put them in prison than it does to get them housing? Or does it? I'm wondering if it does. That's for the taxpayers to decide. And you will decide. Thank you, Mr. Middleton. Next question. I'm a guest. I've come a few blocks from Kakako. I do want to ask uh, Senator Brickwood Galateria why why you're not supporting taking the reserve housing and workforce housing that's being built in Kaka'ako and making it affordable. Those developers, 80% of the units they build, they can charge any amount of money they want. So why isn't the 20% that they have to provide for ordinary people priced so that ordinary people can buy it instead of 140% of the income which is 124,000 in a community where 87% of the population makes less than 100,000. Senator? What Representative Fox is uh, referring to is statute that provides for 20% in an inventory to be affordable housing in all of the developments in Kakako. Uh, the legislature, what we tried to do was to increase the inventory percentage uh, but what we uh, want to end up doing, what we've done, is we ensure that there is balanced uh, housing inventory in Kakaku. That has always been my position for the very time I took office back in 2008. It's not necessarily to get rid of luxury apartments as much as it is to increase the inventory so we have a balanced look, a balanced mix of community. Not only luxury, obviously affordable. 
affordable rentals, workforce housing, kupuna housing, very, very important, the tsunami, the silver tsunami is among us right now. And so that's what I'm all about. I'm all about balanced housing in Kataku. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Middleton. Good question about Kataku, but I'm not sure we're discussing it's a done deal. It's over. Um, there's going to be million dollar properties, multi million dollar properties in Kataku. That's not a place that is available to anyone that's got that doesn't have millions of dollars. So it's, it's already a done deal. They just won't tell you, but I will. Thank you, Mr. Middleton. Mr. Leithman? The, uh, I guess the first question I have to ask is, how do these luxury condos solve our homeless problem? And are we really building units that are affordable to the common people who live and work here? And I don't think we are. I don't think we're building the kind of places that we envision to be for us. We built luxury condos that are going to be sold to people either on the West Coast, from the Bay Area, or from Asia, because those are the only people that have the money and the resources to buy these properties. So what does that mean? Are those people going to live here? Probably not. Um, does that mean that we're going to have an economy? Probably not. That's not going to lose to it. It's going to great, generate more tax revenue. If that's the real intent of this, to generate more money for the, for the state and the city and the county, that's great. But it leaves us vacuous when it comes to new jobs and new opportunities. And that's what we really need here. We need the kind of development that suits our needs and the kind of commercial development that will bring good paying jobs back to Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lipa. Well, go ahead and proceed to our closing statements, just because we're short on time. So let's go back the other way. Mr. Middleton, one minute. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I'm so sure, uh, so sorry that we're short on time where uh, we're going to be leaving out of here shortly. Um, there's a lot at stake in this election. But the voters have the last word. I don't think the powers that be have figured out a way to overturn what the people say. And whatever you say, we're going to have to live with. Do you want a place where the homeless will have a home? Or do you want a place, and we go through the same thing every election cycle, they're on the streets, they're on the streets, they're on the streets. That is what is going to turn this election, the homeless. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlton Middleton. Mr. Chris Sleepa, one minute. Okay. Well, I'll just close by saying I'm a software developer. I've also had many years of work as an investment banker, so I've been on the other side of this equation where I was involved in development of land deals. I know how they go. I know how they're put together, and I know how to take them apart. I think what I bring to the table is somebody who actually has a skill set with year, many, many years of work in technology. And by the way, we're falling behind in the information age. We need fiber optic in Hawaii, and we don't have it. They're laying it north of us, they're laying it south of us, but they're not bringing it to us. That means the jobs of the 21st century are not going to be here for us. We're being pushed aside. I think one of the things that we've really got to focus on is setting a vision for our future and then making that vision a reality. And I don't think we've done that so far. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chris Lipton. Now, Mr. Sen or, sorry, Senator Pritford Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mahalo again for having uh, all of us here uh, to share our views. Uh, and we come together to ask you to participate, to engage civically. That's what it's all about. Uh, Senator Inouye, Senator Akaka, they, they were our mentors and always told all of us, never take advantage, and never take for granted, rather, the votes. You know, you you got to ask for the vote. So I'm here today to ask you to vote for me for uh, Senate District 12. I look forward to serving you once more. I'm a professional communicator for many years. I was involved in television and radio, and I take those skills to the legislature to bring people together to provide for the best legislation to improve and, uh, and to provide for the quality of life that we come to know and love in Hawaii name. So with that, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having us. Uh, have a good evening. Aloha.
Thank you, Senator. Let's thank our candidates for Senate District 12. Senator Richard Galatea, Mr. Carlton Mason, and Mr. Carlton Now we are down to our two final candidates for this evening. The candidates for governor, we have Senator David Egan and Mr. Van Tanabe. We could have you gentlemen up to our stage. Mr. Jeff Davis as well. Okay, let's start with our opening statements. Two minutes in alphabetical order. Mr. Jeff Davis. Obviously, a little high, everyone. Engaging in your political system and your choices are paramount to having a good ending to an election and a better future for Hawaii's keiki. I say Hawaii's keiki. Um, it comes above, above all else. It comes before my name, Aloha, I'm Jeff Davis. Hawaii's keiki are the reason and the platform and the uh, legislation that we craft from the top down. Everything can be followed downstream from the future of Hawaii's keiki. Of course, if you look at what's happening today and what's been happening in years past, the one-party system that we have, that's not what we have. I came to Hawaii in 1978. Um, my daughter's uh, part Hawaiian. She'll be 21 this month in five days. And uh, I'm running on a libertarian ticket. I plan, from my point of view, to uh, go for changes at the top down, which means state-funded elections. It's done in Maine, where you take for the corporation, by the corporation, out of the context for an election itself, and you go for the people, by the people. Uh, so term limits. Well, if we can get these good people, I would say many people who are in politics right now are great people, but they're in a bad system. Let's change the system and let folks go to work. Um, agriculture, a $16 billion drain from our economy year by year. We don't grow our own food. That's bad politics. Energy, I'm the solar guy. I've been in the solar energy for 23 years. I've had my own business. I've been a commercial fisherman, a farmer, a journeyman carpenter, journeyman mason in the Carpenters Union, all here in Hawaii. My radio show is seven days a week, five in the afternoon on 760. Guests on my show, Steve Miller, Richard Moore, David Ige, Chris Leatham, just in this room, so many people have had in there. I've got an education for five years, and that's what's gotten me to this point today. Um, You'll see my jeffdavisgovernor.com. You'll see how much it costs to have a state-funded election. Yes, I am for uh, regulation of marijuana. It's going to happen. I'm not afraid to say that. I want to get all these people out of prison. I heard a question asked, what about the justice system? Mr. I say, Davis, huh? thank you for your opening statement. Oh, that's two minutes? Yes. Oh, all right. All right. Next. <laughs> Next, we have Senator David Ian. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to thank uh, you for hosting this, this evening. I really do believe it's important that the voters have the opportunity to see the candidates side by side, uh, to be able to ask questions so you can uh, understand what the, the differences are. Uh, and it's unfortunate that we don't have all candidates here, but I think that that's uh, it's important for me. I'm glad to be here so that the residents of Makiki have the opportunity to ask us questions. I have 35 years of private sector experience as an engineer. I graduated from the University of Hawaii um, and uh, worked at Hawaiian Telephone. I also had the opportunity to work for an internet startup uh, and had the full range of business experiences. Um, I've served in the legislature now for 29 years, uh, 9 in the House and 20 in the Senate. I currently chair the Senate Committee on Ways and Means. I've been very involved with a number of initiatives and have uh, proven that I have the ability to uh, bring parties together and solve problems on behalf of the people of Hawaii. Uh, it's very important to understand not only the legislative process, um, but the executive process. Many people have asked me why I chose to run this year and, and most importantly to run against an incumbent. Uh, you know, there never has been an election in the history of Hawaii where an incumbent a governor has ever been defeated. Um, but I am running for governor because I'm not satisfied with the decisions being made on, on our behalf. Too many decisions I've seen 
are made uh, for to benefit special interests rather than public interests. Uh, and I believe that we need to stop that and stop that right now. Um, I'm running because I believe that the people of Hawaii want a change in leadership. They want leadership that brings our communities together, not divides them. Uh, that seeks and listens to all views, uh, finds common goals, and finds solutions for the for the people of Hawaii. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Ige. Okay. Mr. Van Tanabe. Aloha. Thank you, Makiki, for inviting me to your neighborhood forum. Um, my name is Van Tanabe, and I'm running for governor. And the decision to run for governor is fueled with years, uh, it's decades now, of a government that seems to do nothing about anything. Um, I running, I, you know, I'm running because uh, I'm on the platform that, besides the obvious problems that our state faces, one of the biggest problems now is we don't have any leaders that can solve any of these problems. They don't have plans. We all have, we all know the issues. We know how tough it's going to be, but they don't have a plan. My campaign slogan is fail to plan, plan to fail. And that's a basic statement. I have a list of plans. I call it the 12 steps to recovery. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, one of them, number one, is to legalize the Ohana lottery. Because I've been listening to all the other people here tonight. All the issues that you bring up are valid. But at the core of each solution, it's going to take money. Without the money, you cannot fix nothing. You cannot help the homeless. You cannot fix the streets. You cannot fix the schools. You need money. And, well, my suggestion is the Ohana Lottery. And you can Google that to get a description. I have a few on me right now if you want to look at it. But the Ohana Lottery is a program that I developed to avoid a teacher strike in 2000. Back then, it fell on deaf ears. I shared it with Linda Lingo. Again, deaf ears. And we got Frollo Fridays. Now, the current administration is not funding our basic health funds, so state health funds, state retirement funds. Mr. Tanabe, thank you for your opening statement. Okay. Now we'll be Hello. taking questions from the community. My name is Mike, I'm from Makiki. So what do you all see as the major environmental challenges facing the islands, and what are your specific proposals to address those problems? Good question. Mr. Oh, Senator, go ahead. Now, what's the time limit on this? One minute. Oh, one minute. Um, I, I believe that the, the major challenge really is the invasive species coming into our communities and really wreaking havoc in our environment. Um, legislature has been advocating for a comprehensive um, um, biosecurity program, you know, uh, intercepting uh, invasive species on inputs. Unfortunately, it has not been implemented. Uh, it really is about creating a comprehensive system uh, starting at the ports, involving uh, all of those in our community. Uh, this past session, we appropriated $5 million to the Invasive Species uh, Council, which is the biggest appropriation ever in the history of the state, uh, because we are serious about the impact that these um, invasive species have on our communities. We know that it impacts the, both the visitor industry as well as our communities. Uh, so I think that that's a start, but it really is about a uh, comprehensive program to stop the pest uh, at the ports. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Tanabe. I agree with Senator Ike. Um, you know, evasive, evasive species are a danger to our agriculture. But uh, I'm also concerned about the development of our lands. You know, we're switching over from agricultural land to developers who uh, claim that they're going to give us some affordable housing. But uh, I'm looking at the development in Kaka'ako. I don't think one of us in here can afford the apartments that they're building right now in Kaka'ako. Um, again, special interest money is fueling this. 
I believe a lot of the money is coming from the Asia Pacific and therefore you know we, we don't have control over this and I don't know who's planning this but I'm sure it's going to cause not only traffic but they're going to tap our resources as far as water and um, other natural resources so bottom line though you know comprehensive studies comprehensive things all cost money without the money that that comprehensive plan is going to stay on the table thank you mr. Really mr davis <clears throat> invasive species watersheds how about that i mentioned i started off with keiki we have to look a hundred years ahead not four years, not to your next election, not to how you're going to get more money in your campaign to run more ads. It was brought up on my show yesterday that the, the person to vote for is the one with the least amount of money. The one with the most amount of money has got promises to keep. Whereas if you want something to work for you, it's not the one who's collected the most money. Watersheds, come on, people. This is it. Without water, where are we going? GMO companies occupying prime ag lands and spraying limited amounts of uh, uh, regulated use pesticides out there. Recent study from UC Davis linked to autism. Occupying prime ag lands, not only does it uh, put pesticides into the, it was over spraying into our schools, etc. But how about this? How do we bring a food to the table in Hawaii if we occupy prime ag lands to grow seed? The environment, yes. our reefs, tomorrow on my show you'll hear about the Kauai reef disease. I've been covering it for two years. Incredible, one of the world's worst uh, reef outbreak diseases occurring, coral diseases occurring right here in the most cherished, pristine place on the planet Earth. You see all this on my website, jeffdavisgovernor.com. And remember, it is about Hawaii's keiki. It's about a future. Not enough money going into our the health of our reefs, our oceans, our waters, our water supplies, our watersheds, and of course our forest reserves. The invasive species goes right back to that forest reserve. Mr. Davis, thank Aloha. you. Next question from our audience this evening. Somebody else. <clears throat> Hello. I'm Amsterdam. Um, what unique contributions will you make in the office that you are seeking in specific ways and, and, and a deadline for homelessness to solve, treat, and solve the problem of homelessness? Thank you. Mr. Otanabe? <coughs> As your governor, I guarantee to reduce the number of homeless on our streets simply by finding out who doesn't belong here. It's a common practice that the northern northeastern states of America have been sending us to homeless over the past decade. I mean, you look at Chinatown, that's not royal Hawaiians. You know, these are people that, for all we know, just got out of prison in Detroit. We don't know. We don't have a handle on that. But after I weed out those guys and keep my promise of reducing the number of homeless, I will take care of Hawaii's homeless. I just wanted to make sure Hawaii was their home. I'm going to run a comprehensive census where we can find out who will need uh, affordable housing because a lot of people working that can't afford rent. A lot of people have physical, mental disabilities. We need to address these issues. Some of them get drug addictions. We need to help these people. And um, Thank you, Mr. Tanabe, for your response. Oh, that's <laughs> Next, Mr. Jeff Davis. Uh, in homelessness, I'm going to need more than a minute. Uh, when I saw what was happening in Kaka'ako, I bought a tent. I moved in for four nights. Kaka'ako is a very okay. special place. It's children of homelessness. I moved in for four nights. My first night, somebody died in their car. I saw the police. I saw machete fights. I saw everything in front of a generation of children with no bathrooms and no running water. It is a disaster, and it's a, it's a state emergency. First thing you do is you get a toilet and some water for these children. Second thing, family only housing, or rather, a, a shelters. As a step to first, housing first. Let's get these families someplace where they're not surrounded by potentially dangerous people who could harm their children. The way that we have built our state in the last few, uh, I mean, look at Kaka'ako, it's the epitome, it's the poster child. There's no workforce housing, 
It's all about right now, how much money can we make right in front of a generation of people living in the street. Homelessness, you see my videos on YouTube. YouTube, Jeff Davis Homeless. You'll see amazing work. Uh, there's an album that I'm putting together right now with some very famous Thank musicians you, in that regard. Aloha. Thank you. Senator Egan. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, the homelessness problem is a big challenge for all of our communities, and it's something uh, that I think, you know, you can't uh, appoint a czar and suddenly 90 days later uh, it disappears. It will take uh, consistent, sustained effort by all, bra all branches of government. It is about the state, the city, and the county, um, uh, and the federal government really working together to uh, attack this issue. It's identifying uh, community partners and nonprofits who can uh, provide shelters in each and every community. It's engaging uh, all of the counties, uh, neighbor islands as well. Um, there are 30% more homeless today than there were four years ago. Uh, and until we all work together to solve it, we're not going to uh, find any traction. Uh, it's about housing first. Uh, and providing the wraparound services that the federal, state, and the city can provide to support uh, moving those that are motivated to leave homelessness uh, to make an improvement in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Egan. We have time for one more question before we do closing statements for this evening. Thank you kindly. This one goes to all of you who want to be governor. You really have to want to be governor. And this is it. There was a session concluded. Didn't really come out uh, the way the Native Hawaiians, the Oha people wanted, the Makai properties. If you become a governor, one of you might, right? Would you open negotiations with Oha to trade the Makai side of Kaka'ako properties that Oha got as part of the settlement? and give them in exchange something of equal value, but zone properly for the kind of building they wanted. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jeff Davis, your response? I'm under the impression that we did give uh, the Hawaiians Makai Kaka'ako, and that they have their plans for what to do with that building. Of course, those plans might interrupt the view of what um, Neil Abercrombie and his friends and the developers and the banks have done Malka of there. Uh, obviously, uh, OHA doesn't get a blank slate from my point of view because this affects us all. We all have to live, work, and quote-unquote play in uh, our urban core. I think the bigger issue on this Hawaiian is their sovereignty. And the idea that uh, the federal government would have the nerve to send out the Office of Indian Affairs, basically, to talk to a recognized uh, nation. The United Nations has recognized Hawaiians as a sovereign nation. Uh, this has got to be decided by Hawaiians. Uh, as far as opening up a dialogue, let's open up a dialogue with everyone. Let's work for the people and by the people and for our Keiki's future. There's one great example that you chose was Kaka'ako, but it's, it's endemic to every situation we have. Without dialogue, without rolling up your sleeves, without getting you familiar with it, you cannot legislate from an ivory tower. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Van Tanabe. The land deal with the uh, Makai, Kaka'ako, um, I can't really think of any Hawaiian who wants to live there right now with all those glass towers around them. So I guess I would make a deal to give them some place where they would rather be out in the country, um, where it's still clean, fresh air. Um, as far as the sovereign movement, the uh, I believe that's a done deal. When President Clinton apologized to the Hawaiian people, he acknowledged the illegal overthrow. And therefore, they said, well, in that statement too, they said that uh, if the Hawaiian people came forward with one governing body, the United States would return Hawaii back to the Hawaiians. The only problem is today we get 150 nations in Hawaii. They got to get their thing together if they want their land back. I'm all for it, you know. Um, I don't know if anybody knows this, but when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and the United Nations told him, you got to get out of that land. You, you overthrew that small little country. Thank you, Mr. Tanabe. He told the U.S. to pull out of Hawaii. Then he'll pull out of Kuwait. <laughs> <laughs> Senator David Egan. 
thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I oppose residential development on Kaka'ako Makai, period. Uh, if, uh, you know, this wasn't um, a, a pressured settlement, it was an agreed to settlement between the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the State of Hawaii. If the OHA believes that um, they don't like the settlement, I'm certainly willing to take the land back and start over. Um, but I do not, I was in the legislature when we went through the challenge of residential development in Kaka'ako. Uh, and we heard loud and clear on the Makai lands that there should be no residential development there. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Now, closing statements. Let's start with Mr. Van Tanabe. Again, I'd like to thank the Neighborhood Board of Makiki for inviting all of us tonight. Um, I wish I had this opportunity with every Neighborhood Board, but somehow I'm kind of <coughs> overshadowed by my two other Democratic <laughs> candidates. You know, they talk about, Jeff Davis said, we got to elect a guy with the least money. I got zero. <laughs> I refuse contributions for the simple fact that if, we, if I, for some miracle, become your next governor, I owe the people for putting me in that seat. I don't owe any business. I don't owe any special interest. To me, Democratic Party, Republican Party, they're already special interests. They have their own agendas. And I don't think Hawaii plays a big role in their future. Um, I'm running as a Democrat only because I belong to a labor union for 35 years. And um, again, know the facts, check out everybody's website, and you know, Thank you, Mr. Tanabe. Amsterdam's the man, Van's the man with the plan. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we have Senator David Egan for closing statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to thank the Makiki Neighborhood Board for hosting this. This election is about the future of Hawaii. I invite you to get engaged, and it's very important that you choose to vote in the primary. You will have an option to make in this election, and we can prove and send a message that it's not about how much money you can raise. It really is about your plans and vision for the future of Hawaii. I am committed. I've had enough. I think that we need to take Hawaii back from the special interest and really return to a Hawaii where we engage communities, work together to solve problems, and, and define the future that we want to leave for our children and our children's children. I invite you to join my campaign and send a statement that it's not about how much money you, you can raise, but really how much you love Hawaii. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Ige. Again, thank you all. And um, I'll use a metaphor. Uh, there's so many things that need to be addressed and platforms and legislation addressed, but without having the proper government to start with, we'll never fix it all. We'll be putting Humpty Dumpty back together forever and ever. I suggest we go to state-funded campaigns and let's stop this from the top down. You can't hire new people or elect new people every four years to paint the trees leaves green even though they're yellow and spotted. We must take the water to the roots and clean it up. So yes, I want to fix everything in Hawaii. Hello, I have an answer how to do so. Not because I'm the smart guy. I don't have a single original idea. I'm simply putting out the ideas I've heard from everyone out there. My idea, let's get real people in there. Let's give them term limits. Uh, let's give them on a state funded election. No more for the corporation by the corporation. And then let's start addressing all these myriad of problems and solutions that we have. If it's not going to be based on four-year children, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, and 100 years from now, then the same problems are going to be recurring and reoccurring. So solutions are the answers, not promises, not I swear to God, not I've been working on it for a long time. How do we get solutions? We get these, we get these um, civil servants and servants of the public to work for the people, by the people. Aloha, and thank you all so much. Thank you, Mr. Davis, and thank you to our candidates for governor, Mr. Jeff Davis, Senator David Egan, and Mr. Adam Kamadi. This concludes our candidates for for the evening. My name is Kathleen Lee. On behalf of Neighborhood Board 10, thank you very much for coming out thank to you. the entire community and the candidates. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we're at the neighborhood Makiki neighborhood board. Where we had Kenneth for him. I'm backing up here so we can get a look at uh, the crowd. We actually had some uh, good discussion here. We had uh, all the candidates for the uh, council district here, council district. For anyone who would like to help the neighborhood board, we can have the chairs piled over to the side only because we have two minutes before we need to get out of the room. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.